The standard model of particle physics is by many considered to be the most successful theory we have. This is the table of all the particles the standard model is made of. And physicists claim to have discovered all of them. Even though some of them live as short as 10 to the minus 25 seconds. This time period is unimaginably small. The smallest time period we have ever measured is 247 zeptoseconds, which is the time it takes for a photon to cross a hydrogen atom. But still, the lifespan of for example Z boson is 5 orders of magnitude shorter. So how can we claim to have detected it? In ideal world, you would have this machine where you put matter in, then you run it and it will show all the particles the matter consists of on the display. In reality though, building such machine is challenging, but we have some, for example, the optical microscope. But no matter how advanced the microscope is, we are still limited by the wavelength of the visible light. So we can't observe anything smaller than 10 to the minus 7 meters. If we don't limit ourselves to a visible light, we can use the electron microscope, which can get us much deeper into the matter. But how deep we have to really go to discover any particle in the standard model? The typical size of atom is 10 to the minus 10 meters, which is still a very large object in particle physics. And if we talk about the atomic core, the size is much smaller, just about 10 to the minus 15 meters, which is 100,000 times smaller than the resolution of the electron microscope. And it is still not an elementary particle because it's made of quarks. So how big is actually an elementary particle? The problem here that according to the current understanding, they don't have any size. So how can they be detected? Well, at this point, there is not much we can do in terms of direct detection, and we have to use indirect methods. Especially, we study the influence of the particle on the surrounding matter. When a charged particle is moving through a medium, there is a lot of ways it can lose its energy, like collisions, excitations, or Bremsstrahlung radiation. The details of this are not important for us, but what is important is that different particles have different influence on the surrounding matter. One of such detectors is the famous cloud chamber. As you can see on the picture here, we have different ionizations for different particles like alpha particles, protons or electrons. There is also a difference between electrons of different energy, as you can see here, where electrons of high energy travel in a straight line, whereas electrons of low energy are kind of wandering in the medium. Moreover, if the particle is not charged, like photon, we don't see any track in the cloud chamber. But what we see are these dots, which are the spots where the photon hits something creating a local ionization. You can also add a magnetic field and then you are able to detect the sign of a charge of the particle. As the particles with opposite charge curve differently in magnetic field, creating different tracks, then you can not only detect the charge of the particle, but it also tells you something about its momentum depending on the track radius. The bottom line of all this is that we can create detectors that can measure the electric charge of the particle and the momentum of the particle. This is still not enough because we need to know whether the particle we have detected was truly elementary and not some kind of hadron like proton or neutron. For this purpose we use calorimeters. If the particle we are detecting is some kind of lepton, then we know that it interacts predominantly via electromagnetic interaction. And there is a special type of detector meant to capture all the energy of such particles. However, this requires the particle to not be very massive because otherwise the electromagnetic interaction is not strong enough to stop the particle. This is the case for muon, which is a lepton 200 times heavier than electron 
which can easily penetrate this calorie matter. But this is also a good thing because heavier hadrons like protons or neutrons can also easily penetrate this calorie matter. But apart from muon, these particles interact predominantly via strong interaction. And this is the reason why we use different type of calorie matter that is meant to capture all the energy of strongly interacting particles. So now we can distinguish electrons and photons from hadrons. And since the problematic muon does not interact strongly, it can easily penetrate hadronic calorie matter. So there is another layer called muon chambers, where if we detect something coming from the detector, we know it's muon. So detection of muons is in fact very easy, even though it's really hard to capture them in the detector. To summarize, we can create a schematic version of the ATLAS detector at LHC, where this inner layer is track detector, meant to measure the charge and momentum of the particle. Next is electromagnetic calorimeter, meant to capture all the energy, photons and electrons, which is particularly important for photons because since they are not charged, it won't leave a track in tracking detector. And therefore, we can only measure its energy and therefore momentum here. Next is hadronic calorimeter, meant to capture all the energy of hadrons. But you can immediately forget about this part because detecting particles using hadronic calorimeter is difficult and most new particles were detected through leptons. The final part of the detector are muon chambers, meant to detect the strongly penetrating muons. And this is what we are going to see on the detector for each particle. For photon, we only see the energy deposition on the electromagnetic calorimeter, and nothing else since it's uncharged. Electron leaves the track in the tracking detector and deposits all its energy in the electromagnetic calorimeter. Muon is going to leave a track in the tracking detector and penetrates the entire detector, leaving a part of its energy everywhere, also in the muon chambers. And these are all the particles we are interested in, since we don't want to deal with hadrons. Okay, I know what you're probably thinking of. We can detect photons, electrons, or even muons, but those are stable particles. But what about these weirdos with such a short lifespan? If we collide two protons and create a Higgs boson, then it immediately decay, and even if it traveled with the speed of light, it would cover just a distance as short as the diameter of a proton. And what we truly detect are the final decay products, which in this case are two photons. But since I teach special relativity, you probably already know that there are phenomena like time dilation or length contraction depending on which reference frame you choose. For example, from the frame of the Higgs boson, the detector looks more like this, where it shrinks in the direction of motion. But could the length contraction be so extreme that the Higgs boson could eventually hit the detector? The amount by which the length is contracted is represented by this gamma factor, which tells you how many times is the length shorter relative to the detector's rest frame for any given velocity of the Higgs boson. And I calculated how fast would have the Higgs boson go in order to cover the distances in the order of one meter. And I got this crazy number. You can also calculate its energy it would have to have for this velocity and I got the number in order of 10 to the 13 tera electron volts. But the energy at which LHC operates is just 13 tera electron volts, which is significantly lower, and there is just no way we can create Higgs boson with this energy ever. But physicists still claim to have detected it. But how? Because there are many ways how to create two photons in the final state. So how can we know they come from Higgs boson? To understand this, we need to talk about the invariant mass, which is extremely useful quantity in particle physics. The reason why it's so useful is in the name invariant, which means that this quantity doesn't change. 
It doesn't change when you change your frame of reference, but it also doesn't change before and after collision or decoy. The definition of this quantity is just simply squared sum of the particles for momenta. If you have just a single particle, then its invariant mass is just its own rest mass. This is also true even if the particle is moving relative to us, because the total energy and momentum exactly compensate to the same number of 125 GeV. If the particle decays into two other particles, then based on their energies, momentum and the angle between them, you can calculate the invariant mass of these two particle system and in the case of Higgs boson, you would get 125 GeV. So let's consider this decoy channel of Higgs to two photons. Even though the probability the Higgs decoying into two photons is just 0.2%, photons are so easy to detect that it was in fact this channel that led to the discovery of the Higgs boson in 2012. The discovery of Higgs decoying into two bottom quarks happened after five years even though it's the dominant decoying channel. Hadrons are hard, as I said. Anyway, now if we detect two photons in the detector, and since we can measure their energy, we can calculate their invariant mass. And if we get the number of 125 GeV, we have the Higgs, right? I must disappoint you guys, but I wish it was that simple. But we need to go back to reality. All we can say that it's a candidate for Higgs. Because again, there are many ways that can decoy into two photons with this particular invariant mass. But isn't it weird? I said that the invariant mass is conserved. And if we detect two photons with the invariant mass of 125 GeV, it must have been created from something that have the same invariant mass in its rest frame, right? But what other particles have the same mass as the Higgs boson that would produce two photons in the final state with the invariant mass of 125 GeV? And the answer is even worse than you can imagine, because it is in fact every single particle in the universe. Do you recall the Heisenberg uncertainty relation? If you just switch energy for mass, you find out that the mass of the particle is uncertain and the amount of uncertainty depends on its lifespan. So any particle can be created with any mass as long as the Heisenberg uncertainty principle is satisfied. So it feels like we are losing ammunition here. What else there is left for us to do if we can't even know the masses exactly? Fortunately, there is one trick we can use. The trick worth of dozens Nobel Prizes. And it is the fact that particles like being created with their real mass. If you collided two protons, you get this energy soup where particles are created. If the Higgs boson is created, the most likely it's going to happen here, which is called the on-shell creation. The further away from its real mass, the less likely such creation is. This is the direct consequence of the Heisenberg uncertainty relation, because the more stable particle, the narrower the peak is. So we can't ever know whether these two final state particles came from Higgs or some other particles. But there is this anomaly in the probability of creation, so we can use statistics now. Instead of just analyzing a single event of Higgs decoying the two gammas, we can analyze many. We calculate the invariant mass of each and form a graph of number of events versus the invariant mass of the photon pairs. And since there is a higher probability of creation at 125 GeV, it will eventually appear in the statistics as a peak in the number of events with the invariant mass of 125 GeV. And you don't have to limit yourself to just two photons because Higgs can also decoy into two Z bosons, which further decoy into leptons. And you can analyze the four lepton events and make the invariant mass distribution for this four lepton final state, and you would see the same peak. Or if you analyze just two lepton decay, you would see the peak at 
91 GeV and not 125 GeV because the probability of Higgs decoying into electrons or muons is basically non-existent. But for Z boson, it is significant. And this would be the discovery of the Z boson. And this is how physicists detect particles. They never observed one, they never isolated one, and they can never take a single event and say that there was a Higgs. Its presence appears only in the statistical data. And moreover, physicists can't even say with 100% certainty that these particles exist or not. All they can say is the confidence level for their existence. Because when you do the statistics, there can be random fluctuations anywhere in the data that level up with more and more data and we can never be certain whether this Higgs peak is in fact real or just random fluctuation. It is the same as playing with dice. You can throw it and get the number 6 even 10 times in a row. But can you be certain that there is something wrong with the dice? Or it is just a coincidence? What you can do, however, is to calculate the probability whether it is just a random fluctuation or not. And physicists at CERN require the so-called 5 sigma confidence level to announce discovery. This sigma 5 basically means that the probability the signal is just a random fluctuation is 1 over 3.5 million. The confidence level we have discovered the Higgs is now much higher than sigma 5, so the possibility it is just a random fluctuation is extremely low, but never truly zero. So what is really a particle for particle physicists? Really just a signal in the number of events versus the invariant mass distribution. Now it's time for a question for you. I said that Z boson decoys into two leptons and we detect either the pair of electrons or muons, but could we detect the combination coming from a single decay of Z boson? Write the answer down in the comments. By the way, if you want to know more about quantum fields and how the Heisenberg uncertainty relation play a role in this, check out this video. But don't forget to give a like to this one and I see you next time.